A helicopter drop is a psychological operation. It communicates very clearly to people that this is money we have dropped out of the sky and we are not going to raise future taxes in order to have an escape, uh, an escape plan to get rid of that money. We're really going to leave it out there. And that's the hard problem. That's what may, if inflation, deflation fundamentally comes from this consideration. And you have to convince people of long-term deficits being better or worse. That's very hard to do. That's why inflation is so hard to predict and to forecast. It's just like stock prices. It depends on people's expectations of, of long-term surpluses. So that leads, let me think, very, very long run. We're kind of stuck. If you want to fight deflations, all the available tools don't really work. Somehow you need to co communicate a, a slightly looser long run fiscal commitment, and that seems awfully nebulous. So that has me, this is sort of what, what do we do next? In the very long run, how can we change monetary arrangements so inf deflation can't become unhinged? There's an answer in theory. You read economic theory, it says this is easy to do. Just put in a commodity standard. When a deflation breaks out, you just say, wait a minute, uh, we're going to peg gold at $1,000 an ounce. If deflation happens any worse than that, we're just going to end up buying a lot of gold that's going to put money out in the system and stop the deflation. That works transparently in theory. Now, it doesn't work in practice, so uh, that leads me to thinking, well, our job, now we should put on our financial engineer hat and think about how could we get something like that to work in a modern economy. Now, gold is, is a, a point, we can't go back to the gold standard, because gold and, and actual CPI get completely unhinged from each other. But we could do something like it. So my current thinking is what the central bank should do is target the spread between inflation-protected and regular bonds. That's targeting expected inflation. It's precisely the thing the central bank cares about, and it works the same way. If we get deflation, just, just as if the price of gold fell too much, then, then the central bank will be shoveling money out the front door, and it's money everybody can transparently see is going to stick out there. Now you say, oh boy, I'm sorry I came to this talk, some crazy academic with this crazy idea. But let me remind you, quantitative easing and the alphabet soup of new things all our central banks are doing are also new ideas. At some point, we will have to fundamentally rethink our monetary affairs, especially if we get deflation. And we've done that in the past. We had a gold stand. We had Bretton Woods. We had uh, interest rate pegs. Those broke apart in some inflation. We had monetary targets in the early 1980s. We've been following sort of a Taylor rule. And now with the financial crisis, we have this big quantitative easing and other stuff going down. So it's worth thinking outside of the box in this sort of way. I may not have the answer. I have the equation. I encourage you to find it. Let me move on to, to inflation. Um, I think my own guess is that fighting deflation, that we won't get deflation and that that, will, uh, that, that current worry will, will retreat and um, uh, we'll have to think about something else. And you may be, in fact, given my equation, again, the same equation there, you may be surprised. Why in the world is this guy talking about deflation? Uh, expected discounted surpluses, what surpluses? Uh, surely, from this point of view, our, our big worry is that the mountains of government debt will result in inflation. In fact, and I, my graph here is, uh, I'll show you the, the graph here is the Congressional Budget Office's uh, forecasts of what's going to happen to U.S. federal debt. Uh, I think you'll recognize an exponential function, and even the uh, Obama administration refers to this as unsustainable, and that's a quote. This is a little more sophisticated graph. The, the object in my theory is discounted future primary surpluses. So there are the primary surpluses the US has experienced. Now these are primary. What counts here is net of interest payments. So you see, for example, in the 1990s, we ran up a lot of surpluses. Coincidentally, inflation was really good in the 1990s. The, uh, break, the uh, breakout of inflation in the 1970s corresponded with a long secular decline of uh, primary surpluses into Actually, 1975 was annus horribilis for the U.S. deficit, and kind of interestingly, inflation broke out. Then, and then here's the current situation, which I'll use a technical uh, term that looks to me like a cliff. So, if you're worried about anything, I think you know this equation would would lead you to worrying about 
inflation. You might ask yourself, why hasn't it happened yet? I wish I had a good answer. I think one answer is that, um, that markets understand this is not going to happen, that there is enough faith in our governments. Our governments will solve horrible debt problems and, and will not uh, inflate away, which is, it, it would be chaotic. It's essentially a default on government debt. As a matter of economics, solving the long-run budget problems of all of our countries takes us, it would take us 15 minutes and only 20 if we'd had two beers before we started. These are not hard economic problems. They are hard political problems, and that's another question. So that's one possibility, that, that markets still have faith that our governments will dig out. And I, I've got to hand it, the European governments seem to have figured out that we have long-run budget problems that need to be addressed now. And the US does not seem to be a little behind on that one. Second, remember, it's expected discounted surplus. So it's quite possible people are willing to hold government debt, it's short-term government debt, for a few years, it's very safe, it's very liquid. You're not going to have explicit default of, of US government debt. Uh, inflation would take a few years. And everyone figures they can get out before the bubble bursts. Uh, and that's another possibility, uh, which, which leads to a less um, optimistic way of it. But anyway, in a few years, both of those circumstances could change. Uh, people could decide that this is really more a forecast than a, than a, than a threat. Uh, and, and start to uh, run away from government debt. Now, to make matters worse, I promised only one equation. Sorry, that, that's, that's an optional one. So that's for extra credit. In thinking about the US government situation, we don't just have the explicit on the book debt. We have massive credit guarantees. Our government is pretty much guaranteed every mortgage in the country. Uh, state and local governments are deeply underwater with pension obligations that I think the federal government will end up bailing out. The federal government has made promises uh, to pensioners, uh, to people who want health insurance, to Social Security, it can't keep. Um, all of these are, are big problems that, that, since they're guarantees, they kind of sit there and nobody pays any attention until, boom, a state or another, an, another, uh, another country in the EU goes under, and then we see that the government really has a big problem on its hands. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us two interesting things. On the one hand, this surplus stuff out here is not, in fact, independent of inflation. Inflation makes our government's fiscal positions much, much better. If we could just double the price level, the US government would be off the hook for all the mortgages it's guaranteed. And those, those nominal, uh, those guaranteed, defined benefit pensions would be a lot easier to pay off if we could inflate everything. So, the choice of inflation as a way out is much more tempting to governments because it, it makes the right-hand side better. That's the bad news. The good news is, well, it means it don't need as much inflation as you otherwise would in order to bring our equation back into balance. And that's really good news. In fact, you may think of the US government as having a lot of debt outstanding. But um, even if we were to default on all of our outstanding debt today, inflation goes to infinity. That would not be enough resources to pay off Social Security promises for more than a couple of years. So, so if we don't have that effect, we're talking about infinite inflation. Well, that's the good and bad news there. Yeah, the, the, the much more important piece of what I think is unfortunately bad news, uh, the Laffer curve. Now, we're familiar, I think, with the proposition that the problem with raising taxes, why don't we just raise taxes and, and get rid of this problem? Well, the problem with raising taxes is you have to raise tax rates. And if you tell people that they're, instead of the government taking 50% of their money, the government's going to take 70% of their money, people tend to go on vacation. Or worse, they tend to move away. Remember, people aren't, aren't stuck in a country, especially the kind of people who pay taxes. They tend to like to move to Luxembourg or Liechtenstein or, or Switzerland when things get really bad. So that's the, the, the problem of solving it by raising taxes. But it's even worse than that. Uh, so I worked out here, what, what counts for inflation is the present value of future taxes. And in this case, I wanted to communicate to, to, the, to, to, people, to the students in this room who are used to these equations, so you could actually see where it comes from. What counts is the present value of tax rate times income. So I have income growing geometrically, so that's what counts. The present value of future taxes is the tax rate times current income divided by the interest rate minus the growth rate of the economy. 
Now, I want to take the derivative. What happens if I raise the tax rate to the total amount of money that I get? That's d log pv d tau for those of you who are into this sort of stuff. Now, even if you're not, you can wake up a second, and I can explain in words that there are three terms. If I raise the tax rate, there's a one out there, OK. That's the standard way that uh, uh, analysts score it. I raise the tax rate, I get more money. Great, let's raise the tax. Soak the rich. Here's the problem with that is term number two. As I raise the tax rate, income goes down because people don't work so much or they move away. But now there's a third problem. Once we learn to look intertemporally like this, this is the one everyone ignores. If raising the tax rate lowers growth, that makes future income much lower. And that is, in fact, the only, the really important term. So I made some calculations. Uh, if we raise the tax rate from 30 to 35 percent, don't you wish you lived in the US? This is only federal taxes. Uh, that would require a 15% reduction in output in order to not make any money. And that's why people in the US say, ah, oh, Laffer, Schmaffer, don't worry about this stuff. We can raise taxes and still raise some, some revenue. But the G effect is much stronger. Suppose we raise taxes from 30 to 35%, and that results, let's suppose that results in 3 tenths of a percent reduction in the long run growth rate a tiny reduction in growth rate. Even without the first term, that kills it. You don't earn any more money. How have, the bigger lesson is how have economies paid off their debts in the past? They have not paid them off by raising tax rates. Economies that have successfully paid off large debt burdens have done so by growing, growing a lot. Growth is the key to, raising, to, to paying off your debts and to not inflating. The danger of raising tax rates is that it kills growth. And conversely, it can happen that if you lower tax rates and increase the growth rate, you do worse for a couple years, but, but then you, you fight the inflation and, and make things. So that's, I think, an important lesson we learned from a simple back of the envelope calculation. Uh, it, it, tells us, it tells us something about uh, what we need to fear and, and the important thing to do to fix it. So what's this pretty graph? So let's suppose that our governments get this wrong and a fiscal inflation comes, and that markets at some point decide, look, we got to get out. We're going to get rid of the dollar. Uh, and What will that look like? I wanted to, to get some sense of what's the scenario that unfolds. So I have a very simple one in my scenario. And on the vertical column here, the, the first dashed lines, on that date, I suppose that investors give up and write down how much they think the government's worth by 10%, only 10%. What happens? Well, you might have thought, the, you know, if the right-hand side goes down 10%, the left-hand side's got to go down 10%, bingo, 10% price level jump right away. It's not, that's not, in fact, what needs to happen. Because we do have a Federal Reserve, we have a central bank out there that's going to try to smooth this. And one of its devices for smoothing that is it can sell long-term debt and postpone the inflation. So what I wanted to analyze here is how much can the central bank postpone that event? So again, it's a very simple event, kind of like a, a crisis in markets, where markets overnight give up on the government to the tune of 10%. But the central bank does its best possible to smooth that inflation out into the future, which is a good thing for central banks to do. They should do that. Uh, and I, so I calibrated, this is actual calculation, I used the maturity structure of US government debt to get a sense of how much it could do, and here's the scenario I came up with. The dates are just, I, I calibrated it to data in 2009, so that's why I put the shock in 2009. Coincidentally, I said, well, the, the central bank will delay the inflation until 2012. I didn't, that's the next election, which was kind of coincidentally. That's a plausible date, you know, if you're in charge of the central bank or the government, maybe what you'll do and respond to the shock is do everything you can to put off inflation until the next election. So what do we see? Well, the first thing you see is long-term rates start rising, all of their own. Bingo. The long, so what I'm graphing up here is the time path of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 20-year bonds. Overnight, we see long-term rates go up, as they started to do in 2009. Your first signal, some panic in the markets, irrationality has taken no. They've just, they've understood that this government's not going to pay off its debts. Then, of course, as we go through time, the uh, interest rates on shorter and shorter maturity go up. The, the yield curve starts, the long end goes up, and then the shorter and shorter end goes up. And only then, after a while, 
do we actually see inflation breaking out? Um, to get some, uh, some further sense of what this event might look like, I, I took this inflation path and I plugged it through a plain vanilla New Keynesian model. Now, what's a New Keynesian model? It's a bunch of equations, which I didn't want to put down, but they let us think about um, what will happen to output. For example, maybe that inflation will come with a bit of a boom, so it might be a little bit of a good thing. I wanted the model to address that. So those of you who know, the stand, this is the Woodford 3 equations, so it's pretty easy to plug it through and see what happens. Here's the scenario. So again, uh, where's my inflation graph? Inflation is the uh, blue line here. So we delayed the, the, the shock comes today. We delay the inflation four years, and then inflation kind of slowly breaks out. That's, that's the sad news of what we would see there. Uh, by the way, the, the first event is in the bond markets. So sort of like what Greece said, you, you can't roll over your debts, interest rates are going up, bond market chaos only then followed by inflation going up. Here I plotted what happens to the short-term interest rate, that's I, uh, and um, of course as inflation goes up, short-term interest rates have to follow. In fact, here they actually go up a little more, so a central bank, and they go up before the inflation, interest rates have to go up before the inflation goes up. So the central bank in this event would say, hey, don't blame us, we're raising rates. You know, inflation's breaking out, we're fighting inflation, interest rates are always higher than inflation, we're following the Taylor rule, don't blame us. And in fact, it's out of the central bank's control, but that's what you'd see. Unfortunately, this is an expected inflation. Everyone knows it's coming, so output goes down. So what we get is a stagflation. Uh, uh, and, and the central bank is powerless to stop this stagflation. All of its tools, its tool is raising interest rates. Uh, you know, fundamentally, the red M&M versus green M&M theory has come to bite. Now, let me, let, me, let me emphasize this is not a forecast. It's a scenario. It, it goes if the long-run budget problem isn't solved, and then if markets give up on the dollar. That's kind of what a flight, to, flight from the dollar inflation might look at. Now, um, this is not, you know, it's, it's a, how does the central bank things, think about these things? Um, is the central bank, the US central banks, the Federal Reserve, are they worried about inflation? Uh, no, here's the latest statement from the Federal Reserve. Um, measures of underlying inflation have trended lower in recent quarters with substantial resource slack continuing to restrain cost pressures and longer term expectations stable. I don't know how they know that inflation is likely to be subdued for some time. Now I said forecasts are about ideas. And so your job is reverse engineer from those statements what theory, what cause and effect pattern is in the, in the Federal Reserve's mind. And do you believe that cause and effect pattern? Or maybe do you have a different one in mind? Well, as I, I, I put down what I think the cause and effect pattern I read in there is the, the way the central bank Fed and European Central Bank thinks about things, uh, I, I, out, I outlined there. Um, they think that they set interest rates, that somehow short-term interest rates feed to long-term interest rates, that this affects demand, and there's sort of cost shops, shocks, which feed into this slack or gaps, and then slack and gaps is what determines inflation uh, eventually. Notice the absence of any fiscal worries in this. If fiscal stuff, it's kind of like some old crowding out might cause us some trouble. This is unreconstructed 1965-era Keynesianism, which is, is how central banks tend to think about things, alas. 